what, what Jesus is saying here is, man, we get worried, and then wealth promises to take care of those worries. And then what happens? We stop listening to God, and we start going down the promises that this, pro that this promises us, but it all has to do with often, oftentimes, the majority of the time, have to do with the things that you're concerned about, the things you're worried about, the things you're anxious about, the things you're afraid of. And money comes in and exploits those things like a great scammer. We're in a series on consecration and consecrating our wealth. Um, if you're visiting with us today, have no fear. Um, we, uh, we're not going to ask you, we're not going to take a second offering, um, but we think that it's important um, to talk about uh, our money and our resources because everyone else wants it from you and wants it desperately, and God has some good things to say about it. And we said God is the one that we should listen to more than anyone else because He is the safest person to ever listen to about money for two, two reasons. Number one, he doesn't need it. He's the only person who will ever give you advice on money that doesn't need it. There's nobody else. His, his opinion is completely objective, and he reminded us in Psalm 50, I shared this a couple of weeks ago, but we'll say it again, I don't need the bulls from your barns or the goats from your pens, right? And all of you are like, whew, gosh, I don't have to bring my goats to church. We're thankful as well, but we don't live in a culture where this was our, our currency. But in this agrarian society, uh, people's livestock, the people they had on their farms, this was their currency. And so God was telling them, listen, I don't need these things from you, even though I asked you to bring them to me. I don't need it. All the animals of the forest, they're mine. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird on the, mount, on the mountains, and all the animals of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you, for the world is mine and everything in it. God doesn't need anything that we have. When He speaks to us about our wealth, about our finances, He's speaking as somebody that wants us to understand how we live our lives and what our relationship should be like with it, not because He needs anything. He's constantly reminding um, his people of that, and he's doing that again today. So he doesn't need it. And number two, even, even probably better, Romans 8 tells us that God is for us. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? So you're talking to somebody that, first of all, doesn't need your money when God speaks to us in his word about finances, and he's someone that is 100% behind you and for you. He has given you everything, his most precious gift of his son, everything that God has, he has freely given to all of us. And so what better person to take advice from our finances and our wealth on than God? who has given us so much and doesn't need anything in return. He is, he is, the, he is the greatest, the safest person to talk to about these things. So, here's what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna to look at what Jesus has to say about this today. And if you would, would you stand to your feet as we just recognize the difference in everything else that is said today, that this is God's Word to us, which is so different than anything else that you'll hear, not only here, but anywhere. This is God speaking to us. And in fact, Jesus Himself said these words that we have recorded in the, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 24. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Is vermin another name for children? I'm just curious. Like, like I, I'll have to look that up. Verse 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Verse 24, for no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Matthew 6, uh, verse 25 goes on, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about the body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single, well, lost it, worry hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They don't labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more is he going to clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? So Jesus said, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans, meaning those that don't know God, they run, around, they run after all these things. And all these things will be given, uh, I'm sorry, they ran for all these, but your heavenly Father knows that you need them. So seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. 
Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. (laughs) Amen. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And then lastly, again, the words of Jesus in Mark chapter 4, verse 14, says, the farmer sows the word. Some people are like the seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes in and takes away the word that was sown in them. Still others, like seeds sown among the thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desire for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Let's pray before you're seated. God, thank you for your words to us today. May we open our hearts, open our eyes, open our ears to what you have for us today. God, I pray your spirit helps me to do my best to interpret this for all of us. But Lord, beyond all that, Lord, you are saying things directly to us from your word today, and I pray that we would be responsive, that we would be, our hearts and our spirits would not be something that you have to pull and prod and force, but would be open to the way that your spirit would lead us. Thank you for the opportunity to be together today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Go ahead and be seated. So really, really simple when you think about this, why is it important that we listen to God about our wealth, about our money? And there was a big hint in what we just read. In fact, I don't know if you can notice it, but I threw a few words in bold there for us because in those two short passages, the word worry is repeated something like eight, nine times. Worry, 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 worry. And if you start actually looking in the New Testament, where, where Jesus himself or just anywhere in the New Testament starts talking about money or wealth, it is oftentimes in the context of fear and worry. Interesting. It's often within, within this, this place of the things that we're worried about and we're afraid of. And this word worry literally just means to be anxious or troubled with cares. To be anxious or troubled with cares. You're going to hear today, probably over and over again, but you'll realize that it's not about money, but it's God using money to get to something else that is really important in our lives. And it's this thing, these things that overwhelm us that we become concerned and anxious about in the cares of our life. You know, I I just Googled, and you can find several places that have done research and polls. What What are the top fears? What are the top concerns, the things that makes us anxious as Americans? this year's things are still coming out. So if you look back one year ago, some, not even a full year when you look at when it came out, America's top 10 fears, 2023, according to, to one poll. What, uh, these aren't necessarily in, in the list of top to bottom, but they're the top 10. Number one, loved ones dying. Number two, very close, loved ones becoming seriously ill. And then number three, along the same theme, but personally becoming seriously ill. Number four, not having enough money for retirement. Number five, as we we prayed about earlier, mass shootings or gun violence. Number six, losing physical mobility. Number seven, corrupt government officials. Number eight, chronic diseases. Number nine, high medical bills. And number 10, the U.S. getting involved in another world war. Man, those are significant things. I mean, if you keep going down the list, there's like zombies, you know, and uh, chocolate, weird things that people are afraid of. But... These are the top things that happen to be at the top of our minds as Americans. I'd say all of the things on that list are pretty serious. I mean, there's a lot of things that we're concerned about, a lot of things that are happening in our world, in our lives. I wonder, I'd love to go back if I had time to look at loved ones dying, loved ones becoming seriously ill. Were those at the top before we go through this global pandemic? Are those things that have just risen now that we've seen uh, how, how short life can be and how things can change. But it just speaks that when you look at this, you can kind of see what's going on in our world and you can see that these things come about. What, what, are the, what are the fears in your life? Some of these probably make your top 10 list, but some of them might be missing from your own life, things that are specific and personal to you, things that you're thinking and you're concerned about. Listen, I want you to hear me today. When God speaks to us in his word, but just in general, when he speaks to us, about our wealth and our money, what he is really trying to get at is to help us with our fears and anxiety and to use releasing our money and our wealth as a way to do that. I don't have a clue, really, when you look at a list like this. Have you guys been to a movie lately in a theater and it's like six previews? It feels like 12 previews. And, um, and like five of six of them are horror movies. I, It's not even that I I think the content of horror movies is a little crazy, and I don't think we probably should watch it, but I'm wondering, like, do people really, are they like, I'm not afraid enough? 
you know what I want to do? Do anybody want to go 7 o'clock tonight and get more afraid? Like, I, I, don't, I don't quite get it. I, I spend most of my time talking with people that are afraid, afraid of, especially the top ones, of something happening to someone they love, or they're afraid they might lose their job, or there's things going on. It's like, man, I need to let off some steam. Let's go get afraid, and let's watch some more movies. I don't know. They're making them, so someone's watching them, but I don't think any of us need more fear. Anybody? Four out of 10 Americans right now, 40%, that's almost half the room, feel, felt more anxious in 2023 than they did in 2022. Do, do we need more reasons to feel anxious and worried? I don't think so, but maybe it's just kind of like driving by a car wreck. We can't stop and we can't help but look, even though we know that we don't need to and we shouldn't, but there's something that is a weird relationship that we have with fear. Like I said a moment ago that, that uh, this is affecting us deeply with the depression, the anxiety, the worry. So listen, I think this is pretty relevant, that God wants to speak to us and God wants to talk to us about our wealth and our money because ultimately, I think He doesn't want us to be scammed by the message that comes to us oftentimes in the form of money. You know, in 2022, so two years ago, I, I couldn't catch the, the latest statistics. This is unbelievable to me, though. $137 billion were scammed out of Americans in 2022. $137 billion, almost $50 billion, $48 billion out of senior adults. And that's something that always concerns me. We run into it even from here in our church and people that are older in our church, that they are targeting older people. And you know why? It, they find it easier to bring out the fears in older people that may not fully understand something. So convince older people of something they're very afraid of and then offer them to buy something to fix it. And it not fix it and then you have them in this death loop and it just continues to happen. We all know. I mean, anybody just like not answer their phone anymore because you're like, yeah, if I don't see the name, don't answer it, right? I picked up the phone the other day and it was like my best friend called me. Hey, Mark, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm good. This is so-and-so from Clean Air. Oh, you're not my friend. Heck, you know, but I mean, they make it sound like it's been a long time since you've talked to someone with clean energy or whoever it was, right? But it's usually the best scams are exploiting your fears. You worried about you worried about identity theft? Here's the way you can fix it. You know how many people lose their identity with a scam that tells you that you should be concerned and fix the fact that you might lose your identity? It's just really easy to exploit fears. This is what Jesus is talking about wealth does. Actually, look at Mark chapter 4. We'll look at this again. We just read it. The farmer sows the word. The word, if you want to say it just most simply is just the farmer being God in this parable, in this story, is that God is always sowing. He's always handing out information, truths about who he is and truth about life. He's sowing that. He's, he's putting it out into the world so that it will go into your heart, my heart, and my mind about who he is. And it says some people, so we're the people that receive that, that seed, that, that truth about who God is, and so we receive it. And some people like to see it along the path where the word is sown, as soon as they hear it, Satan comes in and takes that word away that was sown in them. So sometimes it's the enemy, it's Satan himself that does it, but other times, it says here later, still others, like seed among the thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, here is the context again, and the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. That literally, this deceitfulness of wealth comes into our life and chokes out what God is trying to do to teach us, to lead us, to what He's trying to form inside of our lives and our hearts, and the wealth just chokes it out. And so we begin to follow down the path of what wealth is promising. And here's, here's how we know that. This word deceitfulness, deceitfulness of wealth, literally means, a simple definition, that which gives a false impression. That, one, that, that which is, is putting on something that is not real, but to try to convince you of that. And so it's really simple. Is what, what Jesus is saying here is, man, we get worried, and then wealth promises to take care of those worries. And then what happens? We stop listening to God, and we start going down to the promises that this, pr that this promises us. But it all has to do with, often, oftentimes, the majority of the time, have to do with the things that you're concerned about, the things you're worried about, the things you're anxious about, the things you're afraid of. And money comes in and exploits those things like a great scammer. Oh, you're worried about this? Are you worried about that? Boy, if you just had more of me, everything would be better. Everything would be taken care of, right? 
But we know that that's not true. In fact, not only does it not take care of our worries and fears, but how many of you realized that when you, especially when it comes with wealth, when you get more of it, it seems like you have more of the fear and anxiety. Oh, I just want a, a better job. I want to make more money. So you make more money, and then you end up buying a, a bigger house, or you buy a nicer car, and then what are you stressed about? I got to make more money to cover all of this, or I can't lose my job. I can't do this because I don't have less. I don't have to get rid of this. And it just adds fuel to the fire. It does not take care of it. And God sees all this, and He wants to free us of this, this hamster wheel that takes us nowhere. Why does God command us to give? Because giving to God is a way to free us from our fear and anxiety. I am so convinced of it, that God tells us to give to Him because He does not want us in bondage and slavery to the deceitfulness of wealth that promises all these things, and then we just end up deeper in our own fears and our own worries. But that's, that's the core of it today. That, that, that let's, let's listen to what God has to say. Why should I give? so that I, my life doesn't have to be dominated by these fears. Jerry brought up my wife um, a few weeks ago in the giving, uh, giving time for offering, how she noticed in Hebrews 13 that giving was still within the same context. And he, she read this verse, I wanted to read it again. It says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Why? Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? There it is again. Keep your life free of money and realize this, that God is always with you. He'll never forsake you. You don't have to be afraid. There it is again. God just constantly saying, you've got fears, you've got worries. You know, a good way to, to help you start to realize that there's things you don't need to be afraid of, stop trusting in your wealth. Stop trusting in your money. Giving to God helps you get over your fears and your worries. I remember as a young boy, I've shown this before, but it's probably been a long time, but when I first started mowing lawns, the neighbors, you know, hey, would you like to mow the lawn? I'm like, absolutely. I got five bucks. My, my son the other day, the neighbor said, hey, would you mow my lawn for me? Here's $30. I'm like, man, that's inflation. Uh, I mean, I, I would mow lawns for $30. Maybe I'll mow the lawn for you for 30 bucks. But anyway, $5, I come home every single time. So grateful for this. My dad would sit down and say, okay, how much is 10%? We'll get into this in a moment. But the Bible talks about giving 10% of what you have to God, to the church. And so I'd sit down, and it didn't take long. You start to figure out, oh, it's 50 cents. He'd say, okay, give me 50 cents, set it aside. We're going to give that to church on Sunday. And I learned from this early age two things. We live off of 90% or less. My family oftentimes gave more. And we weren't driven by money. We weren't worried about it because we went to God when we needed things. And it was the symbol constantly as a young kid. I am so grateful. I've never known anything different. Never know anything different. It's never even crossed. I would feel, as, as we, we can even see in Scripture, I would be scared to death. And I, I don't mean this to compare you with me. I'd be scared to death to keep 100%. Just because of what my parents did as a kid. I'd be like, oh my gosh, that's not mine. Like, that is not mine. That is God's. I'm so grateful for that principle. We didn't all, we're able to grow up that way. So we're on a different journey. And that's why we want to talk about today. You're going to hear a great testimony of someone that had figured this out later in their own 20s. And maybe that's where you're at. But you begin to realize, and so my fear in my own life is not about whether I'll have money or not have money. My fear is always, God, what is it you're asking of me? Because I don't want to keep anything that you want me to give. Because you're the one that takes care of everything. You're the one that does this. So, um, I, I shared with you, well, let me give you this, the history of this. So, if you've ever read the Old Testament, you probably come across the Israelites that were stuck in Egypt for several hundred years, over 400 years, and they grow as a people into a big nation. And the Egyptians are very concerned about them growing and becoming powerful, so they make them slaves, and they, and they have them as slaves for hundreds of years. And then God comes to this, his, his person, Moses, and he says, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to free you out of, out of Egypt, and I'm going to take you to the promised land, right? And so they, they, they go through that, and, and we don't have time to go in the whole story, right? But it's the plagues, and God's showing himself not only to the Israelites, but to the Egyptians. They eventually get out of Egypt, and they're out in the desert, and God begins to do something immediately as he brings the people of Israel out of Egypt before they get, in, before they get into the promised land. And one of the things he starts talking about is the sacrificial system, and he starts talking about the animals that they're going to sacrifice. Now, first of all, some of you are like, yeah, this is why I don't read the Bible. This is why I think all this is crazy. Listen, I understand that. 
That's normal because we're reading it from our time and from our culture. But you have to understand one thing really quick. Every culture, I, I think it's safe to say every single one, but if not, the vast majority of every ancient culture had some sort of sacrificial system that they did in the things that they believed spiritually. It was not unusual the fact that they would sacrifice animals or something to their God to go do that. No one thought that was strange back then. So just like, you know, they might think it's strange if they looked on us today and, you know, we get dressed up as a family and we go to church on Sunday morning, that, they, they didn't do that. Like, this is just part of their everyday life and this is what people did. Okay, so bear with me there because that's just, that's just what happened. But what's interesting is what God told them to do in their sacrifices. He says, I want you to get a heifer, get a bull, and I want you to place your hand on the head, and then I want you to slit its throat and bleed it out, then you're gonna chop it up and burn it on the grill. Now, some of you who love to do pig roasts and skin pigs, like you're all, like, all about this. For me, I'm like, God, that's disgusting and personal. Put your hand on the thing's head and kill it. I don't wanna do that. But God was doing it on purpose. He's doing it on purpose. It's not just because he, he, he wanted them to enjoy being hunters. No, there was something very specific. So I came across this, and I've seen it once before uh, in the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., and I've never seen it again until I was in London a couple years ago for the Alpha Conference, and I saw it, and I snapped the picture. And so this is, this is a mummified bull from the time of Egypt, thousands of years ago, and maybe the first question to really ask ourselves is, why are there mummies of bulls, right? You think of the Egyptians as mummifying humans because they believed that they would go into the afterlife, right? But they also mummified bulls. There's records, and you could look at it, and we could, we're not going to go and talk about all this, but they, they didn't do this to hardly any animals, but they did do it to the bull, and they called it the apis bull because the apis bull was one of their symbols of one of their top gods that they believed that this bull was kind of like this manifestation of a god that's out there but is now on earth. And so when a bull died, <laughs> they would mummify it, and they actually built huge concrete sarcophaguses to put the bull in because they were so concerned that this wasn't a bull, it was a god, and they, they would take care of it, they would bury it because this was a god and they didn't want to mess up and they wanted to be very careful. Are you catching this? God brings him out into Egypt, and he says, put your hand, listen carefully, not just on the bull, put your hand on what everybody in the society that you have grown up in has trusted in and believed in, and cut its neck and kill it. That is the scariest thing they could do. You think it's weird. That was scary. Why? Because that's what everyone in the culture had looked to to say, that's what takes care of you. That's what meets your needs. You don't mess with that. You bury that. You put it in the sarcophagus. You be careful because that's the God that has taken care of all this. And God says, no, you're going to learn really quickly who the real God is and who takes care of you. Now, if you're still tracking with me because you're like, this is really strange. <laughs> it's really not so strange. Because we don't have bulls and we don't have things that were apis bulls that were, were cutting the necks, but, but God does it in different ways. And he comes to us with our money God. And he says, hey, you trust in money? I want you to slit its neck. And how does God do that? Two primary ways, two, two, two primary and principal ways. One is that you give to God first and then you give to God in percentages. And it's partly the way of God saying, don't trust in this false God anymore. It loves to make promises. It loves, it has all this deceitfulness so that it's gonna do all these things for you. But the first thing that God did when he took his people into, into the desert before they got to the promised land was, I need you to stop trusting in things that are not your God who do not take care of you. Because that's death. If you turn to those things and not to God, that road does not lead to life, it leads to death. And so God comes to us in our own wealth and he basically does the same thing. I want you to slit the throat of this thing that claims to be a God and claims to be a provider. And he does that, like I said, in one of two ways, giving to God first, giving to God a percentage. Before I, before I just kind of explain that and, and we'll wrap up, I wanted to give it to you as a testimony from someone just like you that sits here every week, just listens. And I heard about a, a good friend in our church, Jason Bedecki. He's the golf coach at Gettysburg College. He's on a golf tournament right now. He's hoping to do this in person today, but we couldn't get him here because he's got golf tournaments every weekend. That's a tough job. I'm just like, you need an assistant? I mean, I could help you, uh, but I don't play golf well enough. So uh, he has a story of God 
teaching him, even though you grew up this way and you were always concerned and anxious about money, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut that off and start a whole new way and whole new relationship with money in his life. And he's just got a great story, so I wanted to share that with you. So let's listen to Jason's story about this. Hi everybody, Jason Medecki here. Hope you're having a great Sunday. Uh, if we haven't had the pleasure of meeting, uh, I live locally here in town. I'm a dad, husband, coach here at the college. And I'm here to talk to you today and hopefully encourage you with consecrating your wealth. So I would say up until, up until 2014, my view of money was certainly a challenge and it was different than what it is now at 34. And it was really shaped by my parents and how I was raised. And I viewed money as, as more of a scarce resource and you know, always worrying that I'd never have enough. And as, as, a, as a son of divorced parents, it was always something that was top of mind and we always talked about it as a family. And I think one thing that stood out to me now today is you know, when after getting married to my amazing wife, Kaylee, who you may know, um, realizing that her family never, never lived with that same kind of mindset, right? And money wasn't something that was really talked about in that way. Um, so for me, my upbringing really shaped that. And I think um, that's been radically changed by what God's done in my heart. I got saved freshman year of college. Um, I had given sporadically at different times, more so probably when it was convenient or or what was left over, right, at the end of a week or the end of a month. And um, I would occasionally give, but it wasn't like I fully understood what a tithe was. And, and that wasn't really, God hadn't really, gra you know, taken control of my heart to surrender that aspect of my life to him yet. And then in 2014, that really, really started to change. And, and I remember that shift when, when the church that I was attending at the time, the church I got saved at, we started a 90-day tithing challenge, which, um, during that, during that release of when we were doing that, it was certainly uncomfortable, right? But I think the accountability of the, the body of believers around you really encouraged me to say, hey man, I, I gotta step out in faith and really test God in this area. And so what it ultimately was, was, um, Um, that money didn't have to be something that was always top of mind, always talked about, always stressed about. It could more so be something that was um, abundant, right? You could rely on God for it. And, and it wasn't something that we had to waste our time and energy on because we believed that God was gonna, gonna always provide, right? I went from you know, a scarcity mindset to more of abundant mentality, right? And that, that was my new view on money and really understanding that God will always provide and he didn't have to, I don't have to fear about not having enough. And it wasn't something that constantly had to be talked about in friend groups and family situation. The other thing that I, I just wanna encourage everybody with was, you know, let go and let God take the wheel, right? And I think that's something that really was, was powerful for me um, in terms of finances it was always something that I felt like I had to control, but God really wants our heart in everything, including our money. And it can be the catalyst to giving up control in every other aspect of your life. And then it really set me down a path. It was a progression, right, of, of trusting God with my finances at a young age. And it didn't happen overnight. And I was really thankful that God taught me that at a young age, at, at 23, when I had less than what I do now, and now I'm responsible for a family. and. Um, you know, to be able to support and rely on God. Now I view money more as a tool for leaving a legacy building and blessing other people. Um, I think a lot about it today in terms of, you know, how can I provide for our family? How can we, how can we leave a legacy for our young boys, right? Brooks and Bo and um, not make their life easier, but how can I show them and be a role model for them to say, hey, you know, money should not be the ruler of all things in your life. And, um, God should be the ruler of things in your life and money's an area that you can give over to God. So let me be honest with you guys. Let me level with you guys a little bit, right? Um, I don't want you to think because I'm standing up here that I have it all figured out, right? It, this is a hard concept. I, I'm aware and I understand that many of you um, may be resistant to tithing or giving or parting with your money. And I just want to encourage you, that's okay, right? To, to leave room for God to work in your heart. Um, I think I was, you know, God really opened my eyes to how to do that in my life. Um, so a verse that really, really was encouraging to me that I hope will be encouraging to you all is, um, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much, Luke 16, 10. And, and that to me was something that really encouraged me along the way to understand that, man, if I can be faithful here at 23, in, in a time where maybe I have less, you know, compared to the world standards, I, I really feel like God can show me what that would look like to be faithful with much later on in life. And I think an analogy that uh, really kind of 
I, my mind goes to when I think about this is, is, you know, weightlifting or working out, right? You, you don't just, you don't just start lifting heavy weights and start moving them around. The goal is, you know, to get stronger over time and build the muscles over time. And so it's a process. And so, like I said, giving and parting with your money is really tough and it's challenging and it just may be uncomfortable. Be focused more so on the process of whatever your next step is, just take it in your tithing journey. And I guarantee you, God will do something really cool through that. Um, cause I know he did an amazing work in my heart and worked in my life in a really big way. Yeah. Just praying that that would be the story for some of you that just start to realize, man, it doesn't, my relationship with, with wealth or finances doesn't have to be like maybe I've grown up or how I've spent my life or it's something that's always thought about in a scarcity mentality. It can be totally different than that. So let me just, let me just kind of wrap it up by just touching on those, those two things, giving to God first. This comes from Proverbs 3.9, several places, but Proverbs 3.9 says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all of your crops. Again, we don't live in a society where it's based upon what we're growing, so it's maybe hard to capture that at first, but it doesn't take much in your mind to realize what that really means. If you're growing food to eat, growing food to sell for your own livelihood, then the first fruit is the most important one. We got something right? You would want to store that. You'd want to eat that. You'd want to sell that right away because how do you know you'll get a second fruit? How do you know you're going to get a, a second crop? You don't know. And so this was the point of God saying, I want you to give to me first because again, God doesn't need anything. So if I give to him last, it doesn't do anything to break my fears and my worries and my anxiety. It's giving to, giving to God first, which is what? It's an investment in him saying you're the thing, you're the person, you're what I'm putting all of my hope and trust in to bring a return for the things that I need in my life. That's where giving first changes everything. It's not just, well, I've got a little extra, I'll give it to God. That's great, wonderful, but it doesn't do anything to break the fear and the anxiety that God wants to use giving to break. It doesn't break that deceitfulness because we can still live and say, well, I need all this first and then I'll give that second. No, God wants to use this to break that those, those, those chains, those bondages that we are afraid we're not gonna have certain things in our life. And then number two, simply give to God a percentage. You probably heard people say, you've heard me mention it, Jason today, a tithe, the Bible talks about that in the Old Testament being, being 10%. And um, it, you know, there's so much you can talk about with that, but you know, it, it, we don't see the word tithe in the New Testament, but what you do see in the New Testament is continuing to give as the Spirit leads. So, so much change from the Old Testament to the New Testament but the bottom line is, though, is that I don't think God calls us to do anything less than what people did in the Old Testament. He calls us to more because of now in light of what we know about Jesus and who he is and how he leads us. But the point is this, just like giving first, we don't just give to God out of our surplus or we give God out of, um, well, you know what, God, I think I'm going to decide and give you this. That doesn't do anything to break again the fear, the anxiety, the worry. God says, no, give me a percentage that I put on your heart and then trust me that the leftover percentage will be enough. That's what God is getting at. Remember, he doesn't need it, he's just for us. So he tells us to give him percentages so it's a done deal. All right, God, here it is, here it is first. Now what? I have to trust you for everything after that. Exactly, that's exactly what God wants. It's exactly what God wants for you because he wants you to be people that are not dominated by this so that he can use you. In every conversation, every interaction you have, you know, it's so funny. My brothers tell me they went to Washington State not long ago and they stayed in an Airbnb and the family that ran it was so nice and just was really just, you know, whatever we can do for you, you want to go on a boat ride, they were just almost creepy nice if you're an Airbnb person, right? Like, like are you guys going to do something to us? I don't know. Um, but at one point, they're sitting around the fire talking and uh, the husband is talking, and he clearly is a Christian, knows God, used to be a youth pastor. His wife does not, and she asks him a question. I've got a question for you. And my brother was like, I wasn't sure what this was going to be. And you know what her question was? What do you guys think about tithing? <laughs> because it's so foreign and so crazy for somebody, because you don't give 10% away to something or someone. You don't do that. Because the way we live our lives apart from God is you got to hold on and make sure that you use every single penny how you need to do it or for yourself or for your retirement, whatever it is. And, and it's so interesting that that was her question. I don't get this, right? In, in her marriage, I, I don't understand. Why, why does my husband want to do this? 
And it's because that literally becomes a witness, even for other people in your life, even maybe for some family members. You know why I do this? Because this is what the scripture teaches us. Uh, not only, Levitic, okay, I didn't say this. Leviticus 27.30, just to read you this passage. Any tithe of the land from the grain of the land or the fruit of the trees belongs to the Lord. It is holy, right? So give that 10% to God. But here's the deal. You're remembering your identity and God's role in your life when you're giving as a percentage, you're giving first. And what I mean by that is Psalm 100, verse three, know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. That's worth repeating again. It is God who made us and not we ourselves. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. The Bible constantly reminds us, you're the sheep, God is the shepherd. Or another analogy in the New Testament over and over again, you're the servant and God is the master. When you give to the Lord, we give to him first. When you give to him in, by the percentages that he calls you to, it reminds you, guess what? You're not the master. You're not the shepherd. You're just the servant. And you know what? That is good news because you know what servants don't have? Problems. The master has problems. The servant doesn't have problems. Their not, job is not to fix whatever they want to fix. They just do what the master tells them to do, right? Like the servant is just to respond to what the master needs. So I don't have needs, I'm a servant. The master has needs. I don't have problems, I'm just a servant. The master has problems. I don't have priorities, I'm just a servant. God has priorities. I don't give anything because technically I don't own anything. The master allows me to keep 90% or maybe 85% or 80%, whatever it is. It's not a matter of God, how much do you want? No, 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 no. It's God really communicating when you finally put yourself in this position and realizing, God, how much do you want me to keep? I remember years ago, our, our, uh, Jerry's parents gave us a really nice car. It was like one of the nicest cars we had at that point, Toyota Camry. It was several years old, but it was nice for us. And so we were driving that around. It was great. And then I remember one day I was driving home, enjoying this Toyota Camry, and God's like, I want you to give it to one of our interns who grew up in a home and had nothing. She had no vehicle, nothing. And I'm like, how about I buy like a really cheap car and she can have it? Like, I mean, I wrestled with this for a month and God was like, no, give her, give her the, the car. So I go and I, I bring this up to Jerry because I'm assuming she's going to be the voice of reason to tell God that wasn't a good idea. I'm like, Jerry, I think we should give our car to Rachel. And Jerry's like, hmm. Well, if God's telling you to do it, I think you should do it. I'm like, no, I was like looking for some like resistance. <laughs> we had, I think we had one child at the time. And so we gave her our car and we drove around for a year, almost, I think it was like a year and a half with one vehicle trying to figure out rides and all this kind of stuff. But it was because I didn't own the car. God didn't ask me to give a car, actually. He said, hey, that's my car and I have someone else to use it. It wasn't yours to begin with. And when you live your life in that way, there's nothing that can be taken from you, nothing that can begin to dominate, nothing that controls your life with fear and worry because it's all the masters to begin with. I think there is a genius in God having us give by first and given percentages so that it breaks this mentality and helps reinforce our role. I'm a, ser- I'm a servant, I'm a sheep, I'm, I'm just the sheep. God's the shepherd. God is the one who's the master. So therefore, we'll we'll finish with this. We come to Malachi 3, which oftentimes pastors hammer on people, and I didn't want to do that, so I'll just throw this in at the end because it's God's reminder to us that it's all his to begin with. Malachi 3 says this, uh, God's speaking, will a mere mortal rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, how are we robbing you? And God said, in tithes and offerings. You're under a curse, your whole nation because you're robbing me. All of Israel, mo- most of them, were not giving to God what he had asked for them. He said, bring in the whole tithe into the storehouses that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there's not room enough to store it. And oftentimes pastors, especially on TV who need to pay large TV bills, will tell you to send in their money so that you can have the storehouses full from God. I don't believe, even though that he's talking about that to a degree, is really not the main emphasis here. What God is saying is, you test me by trusting me with, in this sense, the tithe of their crops, but with, with your life, whatever it might be, finances, wealth, whatever, and, don't, and you will see that I will meet all of your needs and take care of that, and you will see what kind of a God I am, and your life will be full not just because he may, may give you more money, but because you will realize that he is God 
and that other bull, that other fake God over there is not. And when you just continue to look to God and serve him, he will fill your life with joy and peace and patience and all those things which make your life rich. Not money, but make your life rich because your life is one that is committed in following God. Uh, TV preachers love to preach the passage we read earlier, Mark 4. Oh, so into this ministry. Have you heard people say this? And you'll receive 30, 60, and 100 fold. Lord God, that's not even talking about money. That stuff drives me crazy. You don't, you give us money, I promise you, by next week you'll have 60 times that. No, I would never tell you that as a pastor. That's baloney. What is that saying? Is that if you will receive the word that God has in that seed form and you will take that in, God will multiply your faith, your understanding of God 30, 60, and 100 times. The whole idea is to continue to get everything out of the way, wealth and the cares of this world and all these things, so that you can receive what God has for you, so you can have more of Him. I don't need 30, 60, and 100 times my money. I want 30, 60, and 100 times more of Jesus in my heart, dedicated in knowing Him and following Him. That's what God wants for you. So like everything with Jesus, this is all very counterintuitive. Give to God so that you can get over your fears of not having enough. That's the way it works with God. Give to Him and you'll get over your fears of not having enough. And I wanna, I wanna close with this. We read this two weeks ago, 1 Timothy 6. Good reminder for us today. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves from many griefs. Just a reminder today, we're actually really not talking about money. Money is the root of all the cares and desires and things that you have that wanna dominate your life. And God is saying, I'll use money to show you where to go to meet all of those needs. It's really not about the money. The money is just his avenue to show you, you know what, you think your whole life would be different if you just had this job or you drove that car or you had this relationship or you looked this way, if you just had enough money to dress this way or people would finally respect you. God is saying, you sacrifice your money and I'll show you that all of those things, where you actually go to find your heart's desire because you'll find it in him. He is the God that says, I will meet all of your needs according to the riches that is in Christ Jesus. So giving to God exposes all the other false gods of our life and in, in our world around us. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil and God wants to free us of those false gods. So would you stand to your feet this morning as we close and we're gonna sing together as we always do, but I want us to kind of just receive God, Jesus' words to us one more time that we started with today, just into our own life. In fact, would you close your eyes? Jesus himself was commanding us not to worry. And if you're here today and you feel like your life just has anxiety, well, almost 50%, 40 something percent of Americans feel that way year over year. I would imagine most of us in this room, there are things that we're worried about, we're concerned about, we're anxious about, maybe we're fearful about. Let's let these words of Jesus just come and fill our hearts again. Maybe even if you need to, man, lift your hands and say, Jesus, my heart is open to you and who you are. Jesus said, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans, those that don't know God, run after all those things. Your heavenly Father knows you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Jesus, help us right now in our parts of our life where we are dominated by fear, dominated by worry. May we realize today that the gift that you have to give us is you. Lord, you wanted to remove anything that gets in the way between us and you. And that's for every single person in this room today. That's for those of us, Lord, that may have been giving since they were a little boy like I was, 10%, but yet, God, you're saying no. I'm asking you to give more because it's not a matter of a percentage. It's a matter of, of what is your heart willing to do? And so may there be nothing that you're resistant of but open to what God is doing. God, maybe there's more you want to do in us. There's more you're asking. There's a, a greater percentage you're wanting from us. Lord, our hearts are open to what you're wanting to do. Maybe you're here today and this is all brand new. Well, just listen to the Holy Spirit as he takes you step by step to becoming someone that is freed from those false gods, freed from those places of worry and anxiety. I believe God wants you to be free of that. So keep listening to him and keep letting him guide you and he'll move you along the journey as you start to learn more and more how you can become a giver to God. And maybe ultimately today, it's really not about wealth, but man, you just feel God calling your heart today because what he's saying to you is he wants you. He wants your life that you've never given to him. Well, even as we sing this last song, I lift my hands up and I lay my life down. 
May you make a commitment to follow Jesus today or a recommitment to follow him if you haven't been. God, we give you our lives fresh and new today in Jesus' name. Thank you so much for joining us today online. We want to stay connected with you. Be sure to fill out a Connect card. If you want to know more about what's going on here at Foursquare, check out our web or app. We look forward to seeing you each Sunday at 8.30 or 10.30 a.m. Have a blessed week.